Hello and welcome to the DragonCon Science Track presentation of What Happened to the Six Million Dollar Man by Dr. Robert Hampson. As we aren't able to meet together in person, we have several participants in the video chat that will serve as an audience to ask our questions of our presenter. And now, Dr. Hampson, take it away. Thank you, Brent. I am going to pull up a presentation here and screen share. There we go. Uh, we have the screen share. So I was contacted by Science Track. Uh, the Science Track coordinator uh, and director, Stephen Grenade, and said, What have you got for us this year? We got to go virtual. And I said, There is a great little talk that I can give to audiences that appeal to both the science fiction fans and the science enthusiasts. Uh, so, what I would like to talk about today is the fiction and the science involved in what we saw on TV through approximately, it's, it's been 50 years, almost 50 years since Martin Caden published the book, The Six Million Dollar Man. And in 1972, it's actually not The Six Million Dollar Man, it's uh, the book was called Cyborg, and it was a neat little book that had the idea that here is an astronaut who has been horribly injured, and we're going to rebuild him with the science of bionics. And the uh, uh, book came out in 1972, and the TV series derived from that, Six Million Dollar Man, premiered in uh, the pilot was in 1973, and then the premiere was in 1974. So many of you know the story. And for those of you who don't, uh, The Six Million Dollar Man was a story of Steve Austin, who was an astronaut, who was practically, for all intents and purposes, he was injured to the point of death in an experimental uh, vehicle crash, experimental spacecraft crash. But the tagline of the TV show is, we can rebuild him. We have the technology to build the world's first bionic man. And everybody remembers that great sound effect. Every time he would do one of a, the many uh, feats of superhuman strength and ability that came along with the character. The word bionic is actually a portmanteau. It is... Uh, a combination of biology and electronic. And in 1958, uh, Dr. Jack Steele coined the term bionics. He was actually working on several projects for the Air Force and working with the Air Force Research Lab on engineering and biologically inspired design. What Steele envisioned was not necessarily the augmentation of human ability and the prosthetics, that was actually something that was also being worked on at the Air Force Research Lab at the same time. But Steele was more interested in taking inspiration from the ability of various biological organisms to uh, flourish in environments that are less than hospitable to humans. He was actually thinking in terms of what would it take to allow humans to survive in space. So he came up with the term bionic and there was a bionics uh, symposium around about the 60s which uh, used a number, put, brought together a number of these concepts. And so we date back the original term bionic to Jack Steele. That's the real bionics. But in 1972 uh, for the book and in 73 and 74 with the TV show, we were introduced to Steve Austin, who had the following capabilities. He had artificial legs from the upper thigh on down. He had an artificial arm from the shoulder down. Uh, he had an artificial eye. Now in the TV show, this eye was fully functional and connected to the brain. And yet in the books, the eye was actually a camera. It was a self-contained camera. It didn't have any of the brain connections. Uh, but 
it had the ability to record film and Steve at the end of a mission would pop the eye out, pull the film and it would be developed. Uh, there was one additional in uh, facet uh, in the later shows when the bionic woman was introduced, she had a bionic ear as well, uh, which is something that uh, was actually becoming possible right around the time that the, uh, the show uh, started. So we, I have looked, I have searched all over for the diagrams that went into the artwork for the TV show because I just love the depiction that you could see of the bionic eye with all of its connections from here all the way back to the brain and the arm and the legs, which I show here in this figure. I regret that there is no detailed uh, documentation of what this is. But I will say that if you have a good picture and you zoom right in, you find that the description of the arm has product catalog numbers, which I think is absolutely hilarious because in the show, Steve Austin's one of a kind. But if the arm has product catalog numbers on it, then there have to have been more than one built. And I just uh, find this very interesting. But the question now is, and the purpose of this talk is to say, uh, where are we? Can we really rebuild a person into a fully functional body using prosthetics and can we restore function to any semblance of what the normal function of the human body would be i mean we look at we look at our hands and this exquisite rotation the rotation doesn't happen here the rotation actually happens all the way around here and all of the flex and all of the muscles the muscles that control the fingers are actually connected all the way back here so it is very very complex organism that we're looking at if you look at a, the spine having to rebuild, I'm showing a, an x-ray a uh, friend of mine allowed me to show of the uh, what was necessary to uh, rebuild, realign, straighten, and space the vertebrae uh, in the spine just to provide normal posture and the ability to sit and move and stand and lay down without pain. That's an awful lot of rebuilding. The question is, what do we do? What have we done in terms of rebuilding and providing prosthetics for individuals up to this point? So from the 1972, we see a number of the uh, prosthetic legs. The prosthetic leg uh, evolved quite a bit from just a peg leg to something with an actual shaped foot, an articulated ankle and knee, and then a socket that connects back to the stump or to the hip or to uh, wherever the the body ends and the leg begins. In 1972, what you see here on the left, these images are actually uh, what a leg might look have looked like in the 70s, a prosthetic leg might have looked like in the 70s. And at least two of those designs don't have an ankle joint at all. It's just a straight connection from the lower leg to the foot. They do have, as, they, as you see, the increasing height and complexity, which are mostly based on how much of the leg has to be replaced. Uh, they do have a form of knee, and it's just a straight hinge that can be locked. Now compare that to what we see on the right. Those are what are called flex foot cheetah running blades. Uh, that uh, you see two runners, two athletes, each of w which has a single leg amputation that is wearing what amounts to is a great big spring. It's a spring blade. There is a small foot pad to give traction, 
but mostly what this is designed to do is provide the springiness that your leg would normally produce on its own. That picture is from about uh, uh, 2015 to 2016. We've come a long way in producing a functional prosthetic for the lower limb, for the leg, but it's not bionic. So far, what we've been able to do is to have a, the ability to give function with springs and pistons. And so much of what we do in walking is a case of the upper body balance, the springiness that comes from the foot, basically from flexing the muscles of the foot and using the bones of the foot to bend and absorb shock. And th again, the muscles around the ankle. Uh, so it's actually possible to get a quite functional uh, leg prosthetic with, uh, without having to go to anything motorized or nerve controlled. So our picture down at the bottom is uh, Darth Vader getting his, uh, or I should say Anakin Skywalker at the time, the process of becoming Darth Vader, uh, undergoing his, uh, his prosthetic replacements. When it comes to arms, the prosthetic of 1972 was nothing more than a claw. It was a hook. And what you see here are straps that were used to connect across the body. Uh, a prosthetic arm might connect to a stump. And I'm trying to get this up where you can actually see. I have to look at my monitor from time to time to make sure I'm in the right place. Uh, the stump might be up here. And the lower arm here, there's really no wrist joint. But what there is, is there's a claw. And the claw can basically do this. And it was operated by attaching two muscles along the back. Flex the muscles in the back, and it would open and close the claw. That's the 1972 prosthetics. This is what was available at the time uh, Caden wrote Cyborg. But now what we have is a picture on the right is the Luke arm. This picture is from 2018. And it shows a gentleman holding and eating a grape. And he, uh, the entire left arm from pretty much right at the shoulder on down is a powered prosthetic. And that prosthetic is connected to nerves that are in the back of the shoulder, the shoulder blade area, and the upper arm right around the arm joint. That's where we stand right now. There's not a lot of range of motion in terms of one finger versus two fingers versus three, four, five, but there is enough control and enough delicacy that he could pick up and hold a grape without crushing it. So the, uh, the Luke arm was generated as part of a DARPA program to develop an upper limb prosthetic. And it was actually, this particular one is made by DECA. And DECA is owned by Dean Kamen or started by Dean Kamen, who is the guy who invented the Segway. Uh, it also is the very first powered prosthetic that is approved for Medicare and insurance reimbursement. So you can actually have a doctor prescribe this and obtain a prosthetic arm of this type. Now, when it comes to the eyes and ears, uh, it's, a, it's a very different story. The interesting part is that the very first cochlear implants that push an electrode into the cochlea, which uh, separates out and senses the vibrations uh, in what we consider to be sound. Uh, that's actually been around since the 70s. I believe the first successful cochlear implant was from around 1978. So the technology for some form of artificial ear actually comes from around the time of 
the Six Million Dollar Man TV show. Uh, the very first models basically uh, provided uh, loudness and some rudimentary uh, separation of frequencies so that the person could uh, interpret speech so that they could understand one person talking to them. In fact, the very early models were tuned almost exclusively for speech and had great difficulty with other ambient sounds and in particular music. Now come to 2020 and the latest models actually have uh, AI type of programming, really just smart systems that are able to do a lot of the work of speech recognition and filter the data that goes into the cochlea and that goes into stimulating and producing signals for the brain. And also the ability to uh, transduce music so that a person who has a cochlear implant can appreciate music because with the older style from um, not much more than about 15 years back, we're totally unable to uh, handle the ability or have the ability to translate music into signals that would function. But when it comes to the eye, we're quite a bit further behind than what was proposed in the TV show. Although, again, in the book Cyborg, Caden did not propose a fully bionic eye. He proposed an artificial globe like what you see here in the upper left, which was just a replacement that looked like an eyeball, like a glass eye, and had camera in it with various capabilities. But what we had in the TV show is something a lot more like um, uh, Schwarzenegger's Terminator T100 with the bionic eye, fully robotic, fully functional. We actually have the beginnings of a, uh, of a bionic eye now with what's called the Argus 2 implant. The Argus 2 actually takes images from a camera, translates them to a grid of electrodes that goes onto the retina of the eye. Now the retina is where the light and color sensing nerve cells are located. And in a number of conditions, the light sensitive cells can be damaged but the actual nerves that feed everything and the network of nerves and nerve cells that underlies the retina is still intact. And in cases like that, retino retinitis pigmentosa, macular degeneration, it's possible to restore vision by putting an electrode grid on top of the retina and stimulate the areas in a pattern that looks just like an image, just like the pixels that you would have in a video image or from a, a, a CCD video camera. We scientists are working with direct to brain interface where the stimulation occurs in the back of the head, in the visual cortices, which are back here, and putting the electrodes right in the appropriate place to stimulate our brain's patterns of vision and to be able to put together something that looks like sight. Uh, but as of uh, 2013, so far the only implant that is, uh, that is approved by the FDA is the Argus II, which is pictured in this image. There is another level that we can go to in terms of brain controlled prosthetics. All of these so far are working with the peripheral nervous system. They're not actually going into the brain. And what we had in the Six Million Dollar Man was a direct neural linkage to the brain. Do we have that now? And the answer is we're actually working on that. And there's a number of very promising devices and studies. Uh, the most common example of a direct to brain uh, electrode interface is for deep brain stimulation. In Parkinson's disease, the 
patients develop rigidity and a very strong resistance to motion. They can also have problems with their gait where they may be walking along and all of a sudden they just have a hitch and they, they fall over because the muscles just won't move. Uh, we also see problems with tremor where a person reaches and they can't quite reach the object that they're uh, reaching for. They can't quite grasp it. And it has been found that stimulating a particular part of the brain fairly deep uh, in the structure of the brain, an area called the uh, uh, subthalamic nucleus, when stimulated, it actually can alleviate some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now, one treatment doesn't eliminate all three. The treatments have to be tailored based on what the patient is actually having the most difficulty with. But uh, a deep brain stimulation electrode is very useful for Parkinson's disease and a central tremor and restores a quality of life that is something that just can't be achieved using drugs to treat the disease. Um, for the science fiction readers, this actually starts to sound quite a bit like the electrodes that were put in place and the conditions in Michael Crichton's book, excuse me, uh, yeah, Michael Crichton's book, The Terminal Man. And The Terminal Man also proposed uh, deep brain stimulating electrodes. Uh, in this case, the title character was uh, combating an anger disorder. But again, this is something we've seen a little bit of a hint of it in science fiction and has certainly been turned into actual science. Another application of this type of Technology, the brain electrodes that can stimulate and send a signal into the brain is responsive neural stimulation. Uh, some patients who suffer from epilepsy don't have an easy solution to their disease. Drugs may not be entirely appropriate. Surgery may not be entirely appropriate because it may not be possible to isolate a single location where the epileptic seizures start. However, a relatively new device that has come into prominence in the past five years is the responsive neural stimulator, which senses when brain activity consistent with an epileptic seizure starts, and produces a counter stimulation that can block and reduce the, uh, the onset of the seizure and reduce the severity of the seizure. And that's another example of a nerve stimulation. Then there's the work that I've been doing and that my laboratory has been working on now for about 15 years is development of a prosthetic for memory. Is it possible to identify the patterns of brain activity that correspond to specific items that we are trying to put into our memory and find a way to bypass when the memory is defective and stimulate and provide a prosthetic? There's a couple of approaches. Uh, the top figure illustrates the approach that my laboratory has used, which is to go and find the location in the brain where the memory is located or where the information is located and try to bypass the damage by recording upstream and stimulating downstream. There's another approach by my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania where they have looked at the activity on the surface of the brain and said, where on the brain can we find activity patterns that are simply associated with when memory is functioning correctly versus when the memory is faulty? And can we restore the state of overall brain activity that is associated with correct memory? 
and they've had some, some success with their study in human patients. We've had success with our study in human patients. I happen to think that our group uh, is doing it better, but that's, you know, purely the conceit of the scientist uh, with respect to their own work. And a number of people will ask me about the uh, company Neuralink uh, by Elon Musk uh, generated a company to look into interfacing brains with computers. And the major uh, development that is coming out of Neuralink at this point is something called Neural Lace, which is a network of fine fibers and sensors that can be injected into place in a particular region of the brain where you want to put a high density of very, very small recording bits. Uh, this is actually based on a technology that DARPA helped produce called neural dust. And neural dust is essentially um, micrometer sized recording and stimulating transducers that are very, very small. Uh, the neural lace links those together into a network that can be interfaced. And I think in the future, we're going to be seeing a lot more of the use of these very, very fine electrode capabilities, very high density electrode capabilities, and a reduction in size of the electrodes that are currently necessary. Um, it's actually getting to the point where we can start asking a totally separate question, which is when do we as scientists and doctors allow people that say, hey, I want to go ahead and have the implant to do this. Uh, there, we're, we're approaching a time when we're going to have to address that type of question as the technology is moving onward. But let's take it a step further, we've shown the passive prosthetics and we've shown active prosthetics that are interfaced with the peripheral nerves and the peripheral muscles. And we've seen the electrodes and the capability that take us into interfacing with the brain. How do we apply that to prosthetics? Where do we get the bionic? limbs of the $6 million man. Well, one of the ways we get that is with a prosthetic arm. This is Johnny Matheny, and Johnny has the first prosthetic in which the device, the titanium mount for his prosthetic arm is actually fused to the bone of his upper arm. I'm going to show a short video here. Um, there's no audio on it. I'm going to talk over it, but you're seeing the actual nerve controlled limb that Johnny has. Now, the electrodes you see around the upper arm are picking up the nerve signals that would have controlled his natural arm if it had been there. Johnny lost his arm to cancer, but you can see that he has a rather functional hand and wrist and elbow that are controlled by the nerves in his upper arm. Another example is Jan Schuerman, who has a robotic arm that is controlled entirely from signals from the arm control centers of the brain. Jan's Go ahead and see that video. And you can see the connection of the recording pickups. She has uh, two little connectors on her scalp that can be uh, connected back to a set of computers that are controlling this robotic arm. Jan is not an amputee. Jan is paralyzed. And she's completely paralyzed from the neck down from a disease. But here she is using her brain to shake hands, to grasp items, and she has a fully articulated arm. There, there's a fist bump right there. And you, what you're looking at is the activity of 
nerve cells in the brain that control the hand. She's thinking about moving the hand. And that's where you see the bursts of activity as the nerve cells are recorded. And actually, let me go back a second and show this picture. Uh, the picture over on the right is her eating a candy bar. She has reached out, she has picked it up with the robotic arm and brought the candy bar up to her mouth to eat. And that's just a fantastic application. Now the robotic arm is a lot more sophisticated than, the, than Johnny Matheny's prosthetic arm. It has more joints, it has more ability to flex and rotate and such as that, but it's a whole lot larger. It requires a computer system in order to interface it right now. But one of the things that I learned fairly early on is that the, you know when technology has arrived, when it gets, starts getting incorporated into toys. And so we actually have on the market toys and interfaces that people can experiment with to record signals from the brain, but at the scalp level, it's not as detailed, it's not as controllable, it does not have the fine separation of this finger joint versus that finger joint versus anything else. But we have the beginnings of an actual brain interface to computers moving a cursor back and forth on the screen. Some absolutely fascinating material is in what are called BCI spellers. BCI is brain computer interface. And these are devices that when hooked up to a computer allow a person who is totally locked in, someone who is paralyzed from the neck down, it allows them to write and type things on a computer and control a computer, and it's all based on recording the signals that your eyes receive and being able to uh, turn that into a signal that the computer can operate. And where do we go from here? Well, from controlling cursors, uh, our artificial bodies next. We have the possibility for computer interfaces, for artificial limbs, for drone, excuse me, for drone control or automobile control or even industrial control systems. Um, I know that one of the members of the audience spent a lot of time working with nuclear reactors. How much better could the control be and the troubleshooting be and the maintenance be if a person was simply connected to a robot drone that could go in and do all of the work and the person operating it would have full control and full sensation coming back of what conditions are in that highly hazardous environment. But where we're actually going is fantastic. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Actress Amy Purdy competed on Dancing with the Stars. She has two prosthetic limbs. She would put a, she would change out her prosthetic legs based on what type of a dance she had to do. She did extremely well. And she says, I am doing this to show people you can do it. You can get on with your life. It's an amazing journey. And we ask the question now, what's next? Are complete prosthetic bodies in our future? What about the shell people of Anne McCaffrey's The Ship Who Sang and those stories? Would it be possible to lose the use of our bodies, but strap on a starship and head to the stars. I mean, this is the possibilities that we're looking at. Uh, it's a little odd, but I've actually showing a picture of a team that says they can do head transplants. But why would you do that if the possibility is to interface with and utilize a replacement for the body that you actually have. That's the end of the slides and the presentation I've got. I'm going to open up. I need to uh, take the sharing off here so that I can go back to my audience 
and we can have some conversations with uh, with our guests and see what uh, what questions there might be out there. Can I start? Uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, one thing that you did not discuss, Rob, was that, and I will use the example that you put into my field, nuclear. You could also add to the bionics of a person using the uh, device to control a artificial body, how we say, or, or mobile device of some sort to do radiation work, you could incorporate into it the ability to feel the radiation. In other words, you could actually be adding a new sense to the body. You could be interpreting something as a new sense. Have you thought about that? Yeah, we have, because when we can interface with the, uh, with the areas of the brain that control our senses, then we can have the possibility of routing a particular sensor. So the idea here would be not so much, it's in one sense, you're creating a new mode of sensory input to the human body. But what you're actually doing is you're piggybacking on something else. So let's just say we put uh, an electrode on the palm area, the, uh, the area of the brain that represents our palm. And, but to that, we connect a radiation sensor so that if your palm itches, radiation is present. And if it doesn't itch, then the radiation levels are safe. That's the most rudimentary way of adding that type of sense. The other way to do it would be to inter interact with either the sense of smell or the sense of taste. Because if you can add the sense of, you can add gradations to the sense of smell. Oh, that smells like almonds. I it really smells like almonds. So now I need to back off. That's an area that wouldn't necessarily be the best place to work. Or maybe that's where the leak is that has to be, uh, that has to be addressed. So there's a couple of ways to do it. One is to simply give an off on type of sensation. And the other is to utilize the senses that have gradations like sense of smell and sense of uh, taste or uh, color. We could use color vision for that as well. Cool, really, really cool. Um, I mean, you know, the, 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 the evil person asks, um, in me asks, uh, if, you can, um, if you can stimulate memories, um, that sounds to me like you can also implant memories. Is that, uh, is that something that could be done? That's actually not a very easy thing to do. Uh, with the studies that my group is involved with, we have to work with memory that's already there. We can strengthen it. We can assist in the recall of something where our subject has seen the information that we're trying to facilitate. And we can help to make it last longer, to be more detailed compared to noise. It, it, we we uh, talk about signal to noise ratio. Uh, being able to overwrite something is much harder because one of the things you find out is that the brain is very plastic and the brain tries to work even when it's damaged. And so it has a tendency to fight you. And the idea of implanting something that's not there is much more difficult. Uh, it, um, we don't see any indication so far that that would work with memory. What we can do is we can provide sensations. And usually, see we're working with a much different part of the brain when we work with sensory and motor information than when we're working with memory. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, just fascinating. And I mean, it sounds like we're we're also rolling back towards the the initial concept for this, which is um, how do we how do we adapt uh, the human fragile meat sack to uh, to the space exploration? That was actually uh, Jack Steele's question to start with. He wanted to. One of the things that he was thinking of doing was 
figuring out a way for humans to better withstand space environments, but he was also trying to figure out a way to teleoperate so that the human didn't have to encounter the entirety of the space environment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, shades of Bujold, right? You know, with with her exactly. bodies um, adapted to space, but then, uh, um, yeah, I, I think we're we're starting to see a lot more hard science fiction uh, with drone exploration now. Um, and uh, we we the, have to we have to admit that the robotic exploration of space has been extremely successful, and yeah. so one of the questions is moving forward is, can we make those drones have the capabilities we think of as being human-like? Uh, that's the original sense of bionic, so that it could pick something up and look at it the same way a human would do it. Uh, to get into a small hole, humans are, are very adaptive, and they can get themselves into trouble that would stop a tracked vehicle or a wheeled vehicle. Uh, definitely the case. Well, if you begin to add to the capabilities like the original cyborg or the six million dollar man, one of the things that, that struck me was they postulated some kind of a nuclear power source in the in the legs. So you already got my interest right there, which is why I'm here. <laughs> but I would add that one thing that has to be considered is that the human body uh, not only generates the signals that does what it does, moving the legs, but it also generates the power and it gets rid of the heat. And if you begin to increase the amount of power that is being used, you may be able to do that with some device, whether it be nuclear or some stored energy, but you're going to have a heat issue. The body is a radiator. That's one of the limits of the body being able to do things is to get rid of heat as well as to flush the toxins that you're creating out of the body as well, replace it with, with more fuel. You can solve the fuel problem, but I have this image of, uh, of a $6 million run, man running around with glowing legs. You know, I mean, we, we, we've got nano machines now, we've got quantum level machines now. That, so I, 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 have to, I have to think that that's probably not gonna be an issue um, going It forward. is an interesting case though, because I have been in meetings where a major discussion for the brain implants has been how much heating is there going to be? How long do the batteries last? Where are the batteries located? For the, uh, uh, for the deep brain stimulating electrode, the electrode goes in here and, is, and the connections are brought under the scalp, under the skin, and then the control module usually sits here or here, right under the, the breast bone, where heat is not an issue. Uh, for the responsive neural stimulator, all of the electronics are actually up there in a space that takes the place of a small segment of bone. And there, heat is an issue. And the, uh, the retinal prosthetics also had to deal with the concept of how much heat do the electronics uh, produce and how are we dissipating them. So heat is most definitely, uh, along with power, a consideration that you'll hear anytime you get a bunch of scientists together who are working on a number of these projects. Um, so, so if we fry the there's brain, there's also the it materials aspect. <laughs> yeah, materials. Okay. So, oh yeah, the materials aspect is interesting because the um, the electrodes that go in place can break down, uh, or the body will decide it's for an object and encapsulate it, and when that happens in the brain, it's not functional anymore. Yeah, Brent, you were going to say. So you mentioned the retinal prosthetic, and that made me think of Geordi's visor from Star Trek. How much of this do you think we'll be able to have where it's actually an external component that integrates with some receiver so that, like Geordi, you can swap out different visors, you know, with the uh, Pastorius, with the, the running, the Cheetah right. Blade beginning, swapping legs for different tasks, and then learning to control the different prosthetics for the different purposes. Any other questions? Yeah, I had one uh, going back to the, the retinal implants. Um, many years ago when I was at NC State in our technology incubator, one of the companies 
was working on some of this and they're, they were primarily looking at how to get it into the eye and had come up with something that would fold up into a tiny little package, go in a very small incision and basically unfold almost the way a, a solar array unfolds in order to be placed in the back of the eye. But when you were starting to talk about the musk neural lace idea, it made me wonder whether there's any kind of cross pollination of some of these things, because to me that approach seems as if it might be applicable to placing a group of sensors in the right spot. So how, how often do these teams talk to one another and share these ideas back and forth. The team behind the Argus 2 needed somebody to design their electrode. And they hired a professor from NC State, who in all likelihood is the same person you're thinking of. Might have been. And, and this is one of the things that happens is if you're working on a design, then you go figure out you go find who's already figured it out. And there is an awful lot of cross pollination because that same professor talked with the group that was doing muscle prosthetics, our uh, prosthetic project, the eye prosthetic project. And I know that there has been some interaction with people out of his laboratory who have at least talked with Neuralink, Musk's uh, company. And so there is an awful lot of that. What typically happens is people who are grad students and postdocs uh, with one professor will then go to another laboratory that is working on something similar. And, and we talked with him as well because we were, we were trying to get him to come up with better electrodes for what we do as well. I have a question, uh, which is um, you can make the device and you can, you have the person but in, in my field, the problem has always been the interfaces. Uh, and not only the interface itself, but damage to the interface due to use, normal use. How much of a problem do you foresee in your area or in the $6 million er man area where the interface itself wears out and becomes a problem? That is the human part of the interface. Well, one of the biggest issues that we see in neuroscience is the fact that electrodes break down. So the electrodes that we may have implanted to be either the stimulating or the recording end of a prosthetic are sitting in a salty bath That's true. That's true. at 37C uh, with lots of other acids and uh, fats and proteins that like to stick to them. And the biggest issue that we have in the neurosciences is how long does an electrode last? When I first got started in the field, the answer to that was two weeks. Uh, I do know of groups who have been doing research into how to make the electrodes last longer. And the uh, the cochlear implants and the DBS electrodes are in the five to 10 year range and better and up. Uh, it depends on where, it depends on what they're made of. Uh, there's always been the case of how well does the body treat stainless steel versus titanium versus platinum uh, versus uh, platinum iridium or silver or anything else like that. Uh, stainless steel and silver end up breaking down. Um, uh, platinum iridium can get encapsulated, but when you start using polyimides and the and platinum embedded in that, and you start getting down to the carbon nanotube, I know that Les Johnson asked me the question when he was working on his graphene book, whether I thought graphene would make a very good uh, conductor or a very good electrode device. And I said, part of the problem is you're going to have to insulate the graphene because it is too good a conductor. But 
if you have graphene as the conductive part and then you insulate that everywhere it's not supposed to record, then actually that makes an excellent electrode interface. And I suspect that neural lace is going to go into the direction of graphene at some point. What happens when you, you improve the material science and it's the human side that is breaking down or wears out first? Well, actually, we see that all the time. Um, the, um, uh, to be blunt, uh, there are people who are in autopsy with their prosthetic, with their artificial knees and elbows and shoulders and everything else, the cataract implants and everything else. They tend to last longer than the person does. So... One of the big ethical questions that we will have moving forward is what is the obligation to maintain and replace? Uh, that's going to be an insurance question. It's going to be a medical question and it's a personal responsibility issue. Who is responsible for maintaining those implants and what are the decisions that will surround yanking it out and replacing it or just yanking it out? Are we going to get upgrade plans like our phones where we can switch carriers? Well, my phone charge, my phone carrier charges me whenever I try to upgrade my phone anyway. So <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind taking an upgrade on my knees. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be all right. <laughs> that's yeah, right. Yeah. Ooh, that, that's a, that's a fascinating question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've about hit the limit for our time for this segment. I am going to go ahead and shut down the recording. Again, thank everybody for joining us in DragonCon Science Track. We're sorry that we can't be there with you in person this year, but hope you'll enjoy some of our virtual offerings. So thank you very much. <laughs>